While we often talk about topics in computing or about computers in general, we don't ask ourselves a fundamental question, which is what is a computer? I mean, sure, we see these devices around us, but have you ever wondered whether there are different types of computers out there? In fact, as it turns out, whatever device you are using to watch this video right now, there's a very high chance you are actually using what can be classified as a microcomputer. These aren't terms that we hear very often in day-to-day -day speech, but in fact, computers can be classified into four distinct classes. In this episode, we're going to look somewhat into history and try to understand these classifications of computers. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome to another Random Wednesday episode. So right off the bat, there are four classes of computers. Supercomputers, mainframe computers, mini computers, and microcomputers. These are terms that you don't hear very often, some terms you do in movies. But what we're going to do is we're going to break down each one of these categories and try to understand what's going on with each. But even before we do that, first of all, what is a computer? As it turns out, there are certain characteristics you can look out for that tells you what exactly is a computer. First of all, we can characterize computers by their behavior. A computer is able to actually run programs. And what this means is it's able to look at what is essentially a list of instructions and then execute them one by one. It of course needs to be able to do so in a well-defined and predictable manner. And what this means is every time your computer sees a particular instruction, it has to react in a certain way and not in some random unpredictable manner. A computer should be able to respond to user input by producing some kind of output. And in most cases, computers should be able to read from and write to storage. In terms of its common components, a computer should have a CPU. And when I'm talking about CPU, I'm talking about that component on the motherboard, not the common misuse of the term. I mean, I've heard of that term being used to refer to, you know, the entire chassis of the unit, and that's not entirely correct. The CPU is a component in a computer that basically processes instructions as well as performs calculations. A computer has memory, also known as RAM. Memory is used to basically temporarily store the running state of applications. It can be accessed very quickly, and that's why basically program state as well as operating system state is stored there. However, it doesn't actually hold the data in the long term, once it loses power, the data is lost as well. And that is why on top of RAM, a computer also needs to have storage. Storage can of course be a very wide variety of things like hard disks, SSDs, all the way down to older things like floppy disks. So these are some of the common components and characteristics of a computer. Having said that, let us now move on to look at the four classes of computers. First and foremost, a supercomputer. You've probably heard of this, you know, in movies or on TV. It's always this scary room full of machines and it's supposed to be doing something like taking over the world. Well, supercomputers do actually exist in real life, though chances are they're used for a slightly less sinister purpose. In fact, what makes a supercomputer super is in its high processing capacity. It's supposed to be able to handle large amounts of information do large amounts of processing in a short period of time. While in the past, supercomputers are specially engineered pieces of equipment, you know, they have their own custom-made processor, what is more common these days is to simply put together a large number of off-the-shelf processors. So that is an interesting point to note. In fact, your supercomputers aren't really that special, they're just a whole lot of processors put together. In fact, the fastest supercomputer in the world right now puts together 32,000 Intel Xeon processors, which are in fact processors that are available off the shelf. This large amount of computational power is normally used to run simulations, you know, things like testing stress or aerodynamics of a product, or running things like traffic simulations. All these operations are very calculation intensive, 
which is why it makes sense to use something with a lot of computational power to actually run this. And that is a supercomputer. Let's now move one size down to take a look at a mainframe computer. While the emphasis of a supercomputer is in its high processing power, a mainframe computer has slightly different requirements. A mainframe needs to be the backbone of a large organization's tech capacity, and as you would expect, its focus is on things like high reliability as well as the ability to serve a large number of users at the same time. Mainframe computers are usually large, expensive cabinets, and as mentioned, its emphasis is on being reliable. It achieves this through several methods, and one of them is through redundancy. One very good example of redundancy is what is known as RAID, which stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. Basically, the idea is this. When you have multiple drives, you can actually write the same data into multiple drives, and this creates duplicates, or in other words, redundant copies of the same data. This confers several advantages. First and foremost, of course, if one of the drives fail, you don't lose your data because there is another copy. RAID may also help speed up reads. For example, if multiple people were requesting you know, different parts of the same data, different disks can service those different requests instead of having all requests go to the same disk. So there is a speed up in that regard as well. So basically, this is mostly an example to show you how redundancy is useful when it comes to reliability. And that is a mainframe computer. Let us move one size down again to a mini computer. Despite the name, mini computers aren't all that small. Basically, you can think of a mini computer as a smaller, you know, a scaled down and cheaper version of a mainframe computer. And even if it doesn't have, you know, the same amount of processing power, its purpose remains generally the same, and that is to serve multiple users and to perform multiple tasks at the same time. This is one of the classes that is starting to have many blurred lines in the sense that a larger mini computer may not be easily distinguishable from a smaller mainframe. Of course, by a similar vein, very powerful microcomputers may be comparable to smaller scale mini computers. So it is a class that is so in between that it's starting to get a little bit less used. But of course, the idea is still there. The whole point of a mini computer is to be basically a smaller mainframe, and in terms of responsibilities, they are the same. So now let's move on to a microcomputer, which is of course what we are the most familiar with. The key distinguishing feature of a microcomputer, at least when defined you know, in academic text, is the fact that it is designed to serve just one user at a time. Obviously, that's not entirely true. I mean, you can of course set up, say, a web server or a game server on your computer, and technically your home computer is serving more than one user. But of course, the definition works in a general case. Most of the time, your personal computer is just for one user. Of course, other characterizing features of a microcomputer are of course its smaller size and its lower cost, at least, you know, in comparison to the other classes. In fact, if you want to be even more precise, a microcomputer can be further broken down into two classes, which are workstations and personal computers. The general gist of the idea for these two classifications is workstations are supposed to be more powerful, they are used in a workplace for commercial purposes, whereas personal computers, normally shortened to PCs, exist at home and are used for entertainment and lighter tasks. And there you go, these are the classes of computers. So, well, if these terms come up most of the time in a movie, you know the difference. As mentioned, much of these terms aren't really used that much in our day-to-day -day speech. In fact, even as a computer science student, these terms were never formally defined to us. At least I don't remember them. So yeah, it's not all that important of a deal, but it's nice to know that these classifications exist. Anyway, that's all there is for this Random Wednesday episode. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. 
you can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.